Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, excellent turnout on a uh, Friday afternoon. Thank you for making the time to do this. Uh, we're, we're trying to bring a continuing discussion of uh, factors related to Russia, Russian security perceptions, Russian defense and military strategy, uh, Russia's thinking about escalation control, uh, and we've done a series of meetings and We've tried to bring in speakers who can inform our thinking on these projects. Uh, Linton Brooks spoke to, the group, to this uh, group, some of you, uh, last uh, summer about the work of the State Department's Advisory Board on how to deal with, with Russia today. And we're very fortunate to, today to have uh, Steve Pfeiffer with us to talk uh, about um, the future of uh, nuclear arms control with Russia in light of the latest developments. Uh, Steve is known to many of you. You had his detailed biography in the invitation. Let me just hit a, a few highlights for, for you by way of uh, quick recollection. He, he's essentially achieved leadership in two different career paths. Uh, the first was in the diplomatic service of the United States. Uh, he served uh, as a foreign service officer for more than 25 years in embassies in Poland, Russia, and the United Kingdom, rising to the post of ambassador in a sleepy little country at the time, Ukraine, uh, in 1998 to 2000. Uh, and while working in that career pathway, he was also a senior director for Russia and Eurasia on the staff of the National Security Council and a deputy assistant secretary of state uh, for Russia and Ukraine. Uh, then he uh, jumped ship and went into the Washington think tank community uh, where he r rapidly assumed a leadership role in the, the debate about Russia, Ukraine, arms control, nuclear policy, nuclear strategy. More generally, he's affiliated with the Brookings Institution. He has two primary roles there. One is with a couple of centers that are focused on Europe and Russia and, and Ukraine and that set of questions. And he's one of the clearest and most thoughtful voices on those topics in Washington today. Uh, secondly, he is director of the Brookings Arms Control and Nonproliferation Initiative, a project that brings him directly to the topic of today's discussion. Uh, I should note that uh, uh, he's a graduate of Stanford University. In fact, we were classmates there. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, pleased, pleased and a little surprised that he received his security clearances after having served as a member of the uh, Stanford University, no, the Leland Stanford the Jr. Incomparable, Stanford incomparable University. You get it right. the marching band, which is just a little notorious. Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Steve Pfeiffer. Thanks very much. Yeah. Well, first of all, Brad, thank you very much for that generous introduction. I, I should mention, though, we actually didn't figure out we were classmates until I think it was about three years ago. Uh, having uh, dinner at a uh, restaurant in Brussels, yeah. where we came, oh, we went to Stanford, when did you, 1970, yeah, it's, uh, it all, all turned out. Um, anyway, I'm very grateful for Brad inviting me to come out and talk. He suggested I speak a bit about U.S.-Russia relations and what it means for the future of nuclear arms control, and I'll try to break the talk down into those two pieces. But first, let me go back a little bit um, on the U.S.-Russia side and say that at the end of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union collapsed back in 1991, there were certain assumptions that underpinned the American approach towards Russia, and I would say the Western approach in general towards Moscow. A and one was not that we were going to agree on everything, but that you could move beyond the competitive dynamic of the Cold War and get to a situation where on most big issues, Russia would be a partner with the United States. That Russia would want to cooperate, Russia would not integrate into, but integrate w with Western institutions, that Russia was prepared to accept and play by the rules of the West. And so you had in the 1990s things like, before NATO invited the first former Warsaw Pact member to join, the establishment of a NATO-Russia relationship, the goal being to build out a security relationship that would be so cooperative, Russia wouldn't care about NATO enlargement. The G7 became the G8. Uh, there was an effort launched which took a long time to bring Russia into the World Trade Organization. Uh, and, and I think that really underpinned the approach of the Clinton administration, the George W. Bush administration, and the first part of the Obama administration. And I think what we've seen in the last several years is that assu those assumptions uh, no longer hold true with Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin, is that they have a very different concept of Russia, 
not necessarily as a partner with the West, in some ways separate from the West, and in some ways uh, in opposition to the West. And you've seen, I think, this fairly clearly coming back to, say, 2011, when Mr. Putin announced that he would be running again for president of Russia after spending four years as prime minister. And you saw a narrative that had a very heavy dose of anti-Americanism in it. And what you see now in Russia is a very big difference from Putin's first two terms. And a lot of this is really about domestic politics within Russia. If you go back to 2000 to 2008, during Putin's first two terms, you have Russians saying Vladimir Putin had this implicit social compact with the Russian people, in which he said, in essence, you're not going to have a political voice, you're not going to have much political say, but you will have economic security, a growing economy, and rising living standards. And Mr. Putin was really lucky because about 2002, the price of oil goes up, and all of a sudden you have a huge inflow of energy revenues into Russia. And so he delivered spectacularly on that. You know, you had Russia economy growing six, seven percent every year, a rising middle class, you know, people basically beginning to travel outside and, and things going very well. I think when Mr. Putin came back to the presidency in 2012, he figured that that narrative was no longer going to work. Uh, and, and the focus here is, and I think in the Kremlin, the first major objective is preservation of the Kremlin's hold on power. And so the narrative was not going to be economic. And what you've seen, I think, in the last four years is a switch to a different narrative where the Kremlin legitimizes its power by appeals to Russian nationalism, restoring Russia's place in the world, making Russia great again, and a fairly heavy dose of anti-Americanism. And so that's the kind of Russia that we now have to deal with. Now, part of this results in the fact that Mr. Putin believes that the post-Cold War security order evolved in a way that severely disadvantaged Russia. And so you have, he th they talk about double standards. You know, the Russians say, well, wait, it's okay for America to invade Iraq, but then we have questions when we do things. Um, and it goes back, I mean, uh, every year, the Russians organize what's called the Valdai Discussion Club, where a group of Western experts go, and the highlight is you get to spend a couple of hours talking with Putin. Well, in 2014, when he's giving his talk, behind the background is, Valdai Discussion Club, but it, there's a little saying saying, new rules or no rules. And I think what you're seeing in Putin is somebody who says, these rules have not worked to Russia's advantage, they've disadvantaged Russia, and we were prepared to challenge them and we're looking for new rules. And part of this gets to Putin's narrative about the enlargement of NATO and to a lesser extent the enlargement of the European Union. Um, I don't think his narrative has good factual basis but you know, his view of NATO enlargement was it was driven by the Americans, the British, the Germans, designed to hem in Russia and bring military forces to Russia's border. I think that ignores facts like the creation of the NATO-Russia relationship. It ignores the statement by NATO in 1997 about no permanent stationing of substantial combat forces on the territory of new members. I think that's a flawed narrative, but I don't think we're going to be able to talk him out of it. And, and he's persuaded himself that this has been a hostile Western action directed against Russia. So you now see in Russia and in Putin and the Kremlin a readiness to challenge the European security order. And you saw it first and foremost the last two years with regards to Ukraine. Now, the fundamental rule not only of the post-Cold War security order, but going back to 1975 and the Helsinki Final Act was you do not use military force to change borders. And the Russians have done that in Crimea, and the Russians have also then carried out additional military action in eastern Ukraine. Now, those two involvements are a bit different. And in the case of Crimea, and first of all, I don't think that there was a grand Russian plan here. The Russians certainly had a plan for occupying Crimea, but I don't think they chose to execute that plan until late in February of 2014 after they saw Yanukovych flee Ukraine and a pro-Western government come in in his place. And then they pulled the trigger on Crimea. They want Crimea. They have a historical claim to Crimea. Sevastopol, the major city on the uh, uh, peninsula, was originally founded to be the home port for the Russian Black Sea Fleet. And Crimea is the only part of Ukraine where ethnic Russians constitute a majority, about 60% of the population. In what they're doing in Donbass, I think it's very different. You have not in the last two years seen any Russians suggest we want to annex Donetsk and Luhansk. What's going on in Donetsk and Luhansk is basically a, an effort to pressure the government in Kyiv, to distract it, to destabilize it, to make it harder for that government to do the necessary domestic, economic, and political reforms it has to do if Ukraine's going to succeed. And what you've seen, I think, in eastern Ukraine is that they can ratchet pressure up or they can ratchet it down.
And unfortunately, when I look at that part and I say, what's the likely outcome here? I think for the near and medium term, what you're going to see is a frozen conflict emerge in that space. But the result of what Russia did in Crimea was to bring U.S.-Russia relations down to their lowest point since the end of the Cold War, since 1991. And that was before Syria. And my guess is Syria is going to evolve as a bigger problem issue on the U.S.-Russia agenda. There's been talk in Moscow and some parts in Washington saying, could we in fact form a broad alliance in Syria? And my guess is probably not. First of all, I think Washington, Moscow, actually the West in Moscow, have very different attitudes on two questions. First of all, if there's going to be a political process within Syria, what happens to Assad? Huge differences on that question. But also in terms of the current military campaigns, you know, we're fighting two different wars. You know, the Western military campaign is focused on Islamic State. The Russian military campaign is designed to bolster Assad and it's targeting mainly opposition groups in Western Syria, some of which are actually supported by the West and some of which would have to be part of a political transformation. And so until you get a Russian readiness to change that military strategy, which we have not seen, despite the fact that two weeks ago the Russians said, yes, the Russian airliner that was brought down over the Sinai was brought down by a bomb, and the one group that has claimed credit for that is affiliated with Islamic State, you haven't seen the Russians change their target strategy. That suggests to me that Syria is not going to be an area of cooperation, it's going to be an area of continued differences. So the question then is, can things turn around? And uh, I try to be optimistic. I think Brad sometimes thinks I'm a little bit overly optimistic. But let me give you maybe a couple bases for optimism. Two times, uh, 1984 and 2008. In 1984, the Soviets had walked out of the strategic arms reduction talks and the intermediate range nuclear forces talks to protest the fact that American ground launch cruise missiles and Pershing IIs had been deployed in Europe. And I think the Soviet calculation was ending those talks would generate a wave of European protest against the deployments, which never happened. And by the fall of 1984, less than a year after the walkouts, the Soviets were basically putting out figures to resume the negotiations. They resumed, and within two years, you had the INF Treaty, major progress towards START I, even progress on some human rights issues and some regional issues. Now, a big fact of that admittedly was, was Gorbachev, but it was striking how quickly things turned around. Likewise, in 2008, the bounce back from the low point in August after the Russian-Georgia War to the reset in relations. Uh, I know reset is a dirty word in Washington now, but as I understood reset originally, I think reset was a success. It was not designed to get U.S.-Russian relations to nirvana. It was designed to get out of that hole they were in in 2008. And it delivered some things of interest to America. The New START Treaty, Russian cooperation on Afghanistan, Russian cooperation on Iran, things that were important to key American interests. Now, in retrospect, the Obama administration, probably about the middle of 2011, should have said, Reset's done, it succeeded and moved on to a new name for their Russia approach because they encountered what happened to both the Clinton administrations and the George W. Bush administration was you could make initial progress with Russia, but sustaining that has always proved difficult. But it seems to me, as a, uh, so I think there, there's a possibility that we could be surprised, but the, the smarter bet is going to be that you're going to have a difficult U.S.-Russia relationship for the foreseeable future and a major turn towards the positive is likely to require a change in Russia and policy on Ukraine. And unfortunately, at this point in time, I don't think we see a basis to believe that the Russians are changing their policy towards Ukraine. They have modulated down the use of force in eastern Ukraine, you know, but in terms of full implementation of the peace agreement that was worked, back, uh, uh, worked out back in February, that has not happened. So I think we should expect a difficult relationship with Russia for the foreseeable future. That doesn't mean that cooperation will be impossible on some areas where key interests coincide. That will be. I think we will continue to, for example, cooperate on Iran in implementation of the Iran nuclear deal, the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And my guess is on a place like Afghanistan, where there is a convergence of interests in that neither Washington nor Moscow want to see a return of the Taliban or chaos, there may be some possibilities for cooperation there. But there's also going to be a lot of issues on which we continue to differ. I think Syria, Ukraine, the entire question of what the European security order looks like, issues like the INF Treaty. And again, what's going to make hard, or harder to resolve these problems is that a lot of Russian policy is driven not by foreign policy issues, but by Russian domestic politics. And it's going to be difficult for us to affect those politics in a way that might reshape the Russian approach.
So against that backdrop, let me talk a bit about what the Russians do in terms of military modernization. First of all, from the 1990s up until about 2004, uh, the Russian military was pretty starved of funds, in large part because the Russian economy in the 1990s went into free fall. You now have, again, with the influx of oil uh, and, and gas revenues, you know, they have money. They have put a lot of that into modernizing their military. They're now about halfway through a 10-year modernization program, the goal of which is by 2020 to have 70% of the equipment be modern. Now, I'm not quite sure they can sustain the spending levels of that. And you've already seen, I think, some signs that the 2020 goals are moving back to 2021, 2022. But if you look at different parts of that modernization, I think there's some things to worry about, some things not to worry about. And I'll talk about the one that first receives emphasis, modernization of Russian strategic nuclear forces. And they're doing a lot here. But I tend to put that in the not to worry category, in part because what the Russians are doing in their strategic modernization is largely replacing old systems that had they had the money back in the 1990s would have been replaced five, seven, ten years ago. So for example, today about 40% of the Russian deployed strategic warheads under the new START treaty are on SS-18 and SS-19 missiles. Again, those missiles are largely past their sell-by date. The Russians are planning to build 400 intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launch ballistic missiles as part of this 10-year modernization program. That's probably about what they need to modernize the force and in the 2020s maintain uh, about 500 deployed strategic missiles and strategic bombers. So I don't worry that much about that as long as two conditions apply. One is that you have the new start limit in place, 1,500 deployed strategic warheads on 700 deployed missiles and bombers, and as long as the U.S. takes steps to modernize its strategic triad as well. Second area is modernization of conventional forces, and I think we've seen the Russians make real progress on certain areas, certainly special forces, airborne forces, but I think there are some questions about how much progress they've made on, on the broader general purpose forces. Areas where there, there's some pretty significant limitations. One is money. I think we've already seen some of that modernization program begin to be pushed out in terms of when it will be accomplished. Limits on technology. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, the Russians used cruise missiles about three weeks ago coming out of the Caspian Sea to hit targets in Iraq. I'm sorry, in Syria. They didn't need to use cruise missiles. That was about signaling us in the world that they have sea launch cruise missiles. Okay, that's a capability that the U.S. military demonstrated already back in 1991. Uh, the Russians uh, are building uh, what they call the T-50. It's supposed to be their fifth generation fighter comparable to the F-22, which has already been deployed for 10 years. But they've gone from an original plan to produce 100 of these aircraft by 2020. They've scaled that down to about 14 which suggests either the technology is not that great or the money's not there. Uh, uh, one other limiting factor, I think, on the Russians is, and this is something that seems to be almost ideological with the Russian general staff, is they still use conscripts to fill out a large portion of their enlisted personnel. And Russian conscripts now serve a one-year term. And, and my guess is that in one year, it really is not going to be easy to give a Russian soldier the skills and the experience necessary to operate you know, high-tech equipment in the kind of conflict that they might find themselves. It was a force-on-force -force struggle. So I, I think there are some limiting factors there which lead me to say I think we have to watch Russian conventional forces and NATO and the American side need to do things to maintain their conventional edges. But this may not be as big of a concern as we might have. What I worry about most what the Russians are doing is mainly non-strategic nuclear weapons. And there's a couple aspects on that. First of all, I don't think what they're doing or a lot of what they're doing is not visible to us. They seem to be doing lots of things in that area and the question becomes, is that about deterrence or is that about something else? You also have the question of Russian adherence to the INF Treaty, uh, the American charge that the Russians have violated by testing the ground launch cruise missile of intermediate range. And I couple that with worrisome things such as Vladimir Putin's rather loose talk about nuclear issues, Russian de-escalation doctrine, and this sort of general tendency that you've seen over the last two years to nuclear saber rattling. And it raises some questions. And I, I can see Putin talking so much about nuclear weapons, I can see both benign explanations and more worrisome explanations. One benign explanation maybe is Putin feels a need, or he desires to remind the world every once in a while that Russia has lots of nuclear weapons, because Putin sees Russia as a great power but when you look at objective measures of great power, 
Really, Russia's only claim is that it has lots of nuclear weapons. So there's a political incentive there. Another benign explanation would be is that the Russians still, I, I think the Russians still see themselves both vis-a-vis -vis NATO, but also vis-a-vis -vis China as having conventional force disadvantages. So reminding people about nuclear weapons is simply saying, we have something that we can uh, turn to if we lose on the conventional side. But there are also less benign explanations. You know, one is that this is part of a, I think, a Russian campaign that we've seen in the last couple of years trying to intimidate the West, make the West more nervous, and the nuclear part feeds into that. And the most worrisome explanation would be is that Mr. Putin sees nuclear weapons not just as instruments of deterrence, but have perhaps as instruments of coercion. So I think we have to think about those questions. Now, now looking at Russia today, uh, it seems to me that there's a need for a comprehensive policy approach. And I'd break it down, define it in terms of three terms, deter, constrain, engage. And I'll talk about each one of those in turn. Deter is primarily about NATO, and it's about taking steps now so that NATO, four or five in years down the road, maintains its conventional advantages, both quantitatively and also in qualitative terms. Uh, it means NATO taking steps to bolster its conventional force presence in places like the Baltics and Poland. Right now, you have uh, company-sized units, about 150 Americans in each of the three Baltic states in Poland on what's called a persistent deploy, uh, persistent basis. I think persistence is basically a different term for permanent. NATO has a certain uh, reasons not to say permanent. I, I would like to see that bolstered. You know, so for example, match 150 Americans with 150 Germans in Lithuania. Uh, but do things to put a slightly larger conventional presence in those countries. A second step is to work on rapid reinforcement capabilities because it's difficult to see NATO doing what it should do, I mean, or NATO doing enough in terms of deploying forces in the Baltics where it could withstand a Russian offensive. Now, I should say, I don't think a Russian attack on the Baltic states is a high probability event, um, but I don't think it's zero. And three or four years ago, I would have said it's zero, and I think it would be unwise for NATO to assume it's zero. So again, rapid reinforcement capability, uh, perhaps some prepositioning of more American equipment there. There's now uh, this year uh, deployment of a, about a heavy brigade's worth of armor in Europe. If you Google Earth the Sierra Army Depot about 100 miles northeast of here, uh, you'll see lines and lines of M1 tanks. I'd move some of those tanks to warehouses in Germany and Poland where I think they would have a greater deterrent effect. And then I think NATO finally on the conventional side should be thinking through how does it deal with hybrid warfare? not just dealing with it, but how does it recognize it's happening? Because one of the principles of hybrid warfare is to disguise the fact that it's even being conducted. Um, in terms of NATO nuclear policy, actually, I wouldn't advocate a change. I, I think the current American nuclear presence there, Federation of American Scientists says it's about 200 B-61 gravity bombs and, and uh, associated delivery aircraft. Those would be modernized with the B-61-12 and the F-35 coming on board. I wouldn't change that. Uh, there have been some uh, suggestions by my non-governmental colleagues about moving American nuclear weapons and delivery aircraft towards the east, perhaps deploying them in Poland. Uh, I think that would be unwise for several reasons. First of all, putting them there would make them more susceptible to preemption in the crisis. The Russians, I believe at some point, in the not too distant future, will deploy Iskandar missiles to Kaliningrad, from which they could cover about two-thirds of Poland. So it makes the weapons more vulnerable militarily. Second, it would be provocative to Moscow. Now, I don't worry about being a little bit provocative towards the Russians at this point in time, but putting American nuclear weapons into Poland would be provocative on the scale of what the Soviets did back in 1962, putting nuclear weapons in Cuba. And I'm not sure we want to go that far. But third, I think most of our NATO allies would look at us and say, are you Americans crazy? So a move that I think is militarily unwise, provokes the Russians, but also creates risks for the NATO, doesn't strike me as very smart. But what I would think it would be appropriate is NATO needs to be thinking through now, not the hardware changes, but the software changes. How does it respond to Russian de-escalation doctrine? How does it respond to this nuclear saber rattling? And begin to think through things that NATO really hasn't had to think about for 25 or 30 years. The second aspect of the policy is constraint. And this is really more for the United States and the European Union. And it focuses on the states that I call the in-betweens, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, states that on one side have institutional Europe, NATO and the European Union, and on the other side have Russia. And the focus here is to try to make those states more stable, more resilient, stronger. 
so that you can reduce the opportunities for the Russians to come in and destabilize or make mischief there. So in the case of Ukraine, it means continued political support. It means perhaps additional financial assistance. You know, what we've done so far in Ukraine, primarily with the International Monetary Fund, has brought Ukraine back from the, the precipice in financial terms. But if the United States and the European Union could provide some additional funds, that would give them a margin of comfort. Now you do that, but you tie it to Ukraine doing more faster in terms of economic reform. And then I would also argue that it would be useful to provide uh, Ukraine greater military assistance. Not with the idea that the Ukrainian army can beat the Russian army, but you want to give the Ukrainians the capabilities to raise the cost of further fighting of the Russians, take away the cheap military options, and that perhaps helps bring the Russians back towards the idea of a negotiated settlement, as opposed to possible consideration of a renewed offensive in eastern Ukraine. And then the other part of constraint is, in the Ukraine case, is continue the sanctions that have been applied by the United States to the European Union. Those sanctions have not yet achieved their political goal, which was a change in Russian policy with regards to Ukraine, but they have had an economic impact. The sanctions, combined with the low price of oil, have meant that the Russian economy this year will contract by about 4%. And next year, instead of growing, which people were predicting a year ago, now the most optimistic assessment is that the Russian economy will be stagnant, and some readers are seeing further contraction in 2016. And the, the, the hope here, I mean, the, the, the purpose of the strategy is that if you continue the sanctions, if, as Mr. Putin sees, his financial reserves go down, as the population begins to see continued declining purchasing power, more inflation, does that begin to create some unease that might affect Putin's course? I can't guarantee that, but I think that there's a chance, and that's probably the best tool that the, Ru that the West has now in terms of affecting Putin's calculations. The third part of the policy is engage. It's some, and there are some areas where we want to talk to the Russians. One is on key issues where interests coincide, Iran, Afghanistan, a dialogue makes sense. Second, and this is a dialogue that's not happening, I would like to see a NATO-Russian military-military dialogue to talk about rules of the road when you have the military forces operating in close proximity. And, the and the, in the last two years, you've just seen many more incidents where you have NATO aircraft flying your Russian aircraft, both sides doing more exercises. I'm not sure the Russians would take that up. I mean, the Russians, again, may see this kind of risky behavior as contributing to a planned strategy of trying to intimidate the West. But I do think it would be in NATO's interest to try to start that dialogue and see if you could get broader application of agreements like the incidents at Sri and dangerous, missile, dangerous military activities agreements that would reduce the uh, possibility of accidental or miscalculation confrontation. Um, a third area is to keep the role or open for engagement is you know, if Russian policy changes. On Ukraine, at the end of the day, Ukraine doesn't enjoy peace and normalcy if the Russians don't want it. They have too many levers, energy, economics, military subversion. Unfortunately for Ukraine, the Russians have not yet shown a readiness to do a deal. But you do want to leave the door open for that kind of engagement if the Russians make it possible, as well as to broader engagement if you see a Russian policy change back towards a more cooperative approach. Uh, last comment I would make on those three elements, deter, constrain, and engage, is the better the West does at the deter piece and the constrain piece, the more likely it'll be at the end of the day that the engagement piece is fruitful. So let me talk a little bit about the second part of the, of the uh, talk, what all this means for arms control. And the first question about asking me to take a look at is, if U.S.-Russia relations do not improve, what does that mean for arms control? And the short answer is it means the prospects are pretty limited. Even if you have a change in policy with regards to Ukraine, I'm not sure that helps that much. Because if I can go back to 2011, and a time when the Obama administration was beginning to think, what comes after the new Star Treaty? And you had some officials saying, well, let's maybe move on and not only try for further reductions in deployed strategic forces, but let's try to bring in non-strategic nuclear weapons and reserve strategic weapons. Maybe get to a point where you could have a U.S.-Russian negotiation that would cover everything. And the Russians plainly were not interested. Uh, there was no readiness from Moscow to engage. And what you had instead on the Russian side was the Russians drawing linkages uh, from arms control to other issues. Missile defense, third country nuclear forces, conventional forces in Europe treaties, long range uh, conventional strike. And the way the Russians designed those linkages, you didn't see a Russian effort to solve the problems. It basically seemed intended to give the Russians reasons to say, this is why we can't do further nuclear reductions. 
so in that kind of environment, I think that the chances to do more on arms control are going to be pretty tight. Uh, a couple things can be done. I, my guess is both sides will go forward with implementation of the new Strategic Arms Reductions Treaty. Uh, I think the Russians, as well as the Americans, see perhaps more value in that treaty now than a few years ago because that does provide a cap, at least at that one area of strategic competition. And it provides an overall ceiling on strategic forces combined with a certain amount of uh, transparency that I think both sides value. Uh, the second issue is, you know, can the United States get Russia to come back into compliance with the Treaty on Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces? And we can't get the Russians to undo the tests they did, but can you get the Russians to stop the tests and certainly not go into deployment? And it seems there may be, I think, two things here that we might do better to incentivize the Russians. Uh, one is kind of tricky. Uh, it is, can you begin to have a conversation in the Pentagon about something that you probably wouldn't do? Now, I think it would be useful for the Pentagon, for example, to do uh, and have the word come out it's doing a contingency study on a Pershing 3. Uh, it was the Pershing 2 that brought the Russians to, or that brought the Soviets to agree to the INF Treaty in the first place back in 1987. And I think it would be useful to remind the Kremlin and the Ministry of Defense why they signed that treaty 25, 27 years ago. Now, having said that, uh, I don't think the Pentagon has the money or an identified requirement for a Pershing 3. Plus, if we were to build the thing, I'm not sure we could get anybody near to Russia to host it. So the question is, can you get the Russians to think about it, but it's a plan that you're probably not going to go very far down the road on. The second way to incentivize the Russians, and, and I think it's a restriction that we have, an understandable one, is the administration has said very little uh, in public about the nature of the Russian violation, other than that they've tested a ground launch cruise missile of intermediate range. Um, and we've shared not a lot of information on that score. Uh, and so right now, the INF treaty issue, it's a treaty issue between the United States and Russia. Now, if Foreign Minister Lavrov goes into Putin and says, the Americans are beating us up on this INF violation, it's really causing problems with the relationship, my reaction is Putin probably doesn't care, given what the U.S.-Russia relationship is now. What I hope is at some point is that the U.S. government can begin to develop more information where you could share it with NATO allies, even other countries like China. If we could find a way to make this an issue, not just as a treaty issue between us and the Russians, but a, treaty, uh, but a, a security issue between the Russians and those countries that would be in range of a Russian intermediate range ground launch cruise missile, which as far as I can tell, unless it's put up in the far northeastern part of Russia, can't reach the United States. You want to have the Germans, the Italians, the Swedes, the Hungarians, the Japanese, the Chinese going in and beat them with. So is there a way that we can reach a point where we can give those countries enough information where they begin to make this a multilateral issue. And, and that I may change, I'm not sure it'll change, but it may change the political thinking in Moscow about this question. Uh, finally, I think uh, something that we have to do on the American side is we need to go forward with modernization of our strategic forces. That means uh, a replacement for the Ohio-class submarine. It means either life extension or a follow-on for the Minuteman III. Uh, the long-range strategic bomber, or long-range strike bomber, although I think the case for that aircraft right now is probably as much a conventional case as a nuclear case. And it means going forward with the B-61-12 modification. The one thing I worry about that is when every time you see a conversation about affordability of the triad, everybody in Washington says, we have no idea. It, it worries me that the comptroller of the Pentagon, when he's asked about how you afford this in the 2020s, says, I don't know how we can do this. And that may lead us at some point, I think, to think about some of the numbers we're talking about in terms of how many of these systems we want to buy. But my burst of optimism at the end will be, I do think that there's a chance, even with no major change in Russia's approach to the West, there is a chance that around 2019, the Russians will be prepared to re-engage on the question of what comes after New START, which by its terms expires in 2021. Because the Russians do seem to appreciate having that overall cap on U.S. strategic forces. They do seem to appreciate the transparency that a New START agreement provides. And from the Russian point of view, having the treaty expire in 2021 with no successor, it's not a good time. Because at that point in time, the Russians will have largely finished their modernization program, and the United States will just be ramping up its program. And so I, I think the Russians will be interested in doing something in 2019 or 2020. And the question then becomes is on the American side, can we leverage that Russian interest what the, can, can we leverage the Russian interest into going beyond just a successor to New Start? 
you know, could we leverage the Russian interest in having limitations on strategic forces beyond 2021, for example, to get the Russians to begin to do something on non-strategic nuclear weapons? You know, in my ideal world, the next treaty between America and Russia would cover all, all nuclear weapons, deployed, non-deployed, strategic, non-strategic. You might have a separate category off on the side for retired weapons awaiting dismantlement. So you'd have that single limit. Um, Michael Hannon and I wrote a book about three years ago where he said, you know, limit each side to 2,500 total nuclear weapons and then have a sub of about 1,000 deployed strategic weapons. Uh, I think that would be a good treaty from America's point of view. You know, I'm not sure that the desire to have a treaty beyond 2021 gives us enough leverage to get the Russians there, but it's something that we ought to try. I also think that in terms of getting the Russians to talk in a way about further nuclear reductions, we're going to have to address some of the Russian issues. Missile defense, long-range conventional strike, conventional forces in Europe, third countries. And I'll take each one of those briefly in turn. On missile defense, let me make a couple observations on the Russians. One is, I, I don't think the concerns that the Russians have expressed thus far about American missile defense in Europe are very realistic. Um, but I add a little bit of, you know, they may well believe this regardless of what we think is realistic about. When I served at the American Embassy in Moscow in 1986, the Soviets were absolutely petrified that the Strategic Defense Initiative was going to put them out of the ballistic missile business. They have this incredible faith in American technology that if we put our minds to it, we can do stuff. And it was really only about 1987 about when you had people like Roald Sogdayev, who was the head of the Space Research Institute, going to Gorbachev and saying, look boss, this really is rocket scientists, missile defense is hard. But I think there is a latent Russian concern that you know, the Americans can do brilliant things if they put their minds to it. A second observation about missile defense would have been that in 2010, uh, had we wanted to, uh, we could have done a 10-year treaty on missile defense that would have given the Russians all kinds of assurance against even their most far out concerns about the American side that still would have let us do everything we wanted to do over a 10-year period vis-a-vis -vis North Korea and Iran. Uh, but that treaty would never have had a chance of being approved for ratification by the Senate. The third observation I would make is that at some point, if we have further reductions in offensive forces, you may reach a point where there's greater equivalence between offense and defense where we will have to make a choice that further reductions mandated by a legally binding treaty will be, uh, have to be accompanied by a legally binding treaty on missile defense. I think that's some point down in the future. But you don't have to do that now because there's a huge gap between offense and defense. In 2018, when the New START limits fully take effect, Russia will deploy about 1,500 deployed warheads on its intercontinental ballistic missiles and its submarine-launched ballistic missiles. At that point in time, the U.S. will have at most 44 interceptors with a velocity capable of engaging a Russian strategic ballistic missile warhead. That kind of gap doesn't require a legally binding limit. And that's, again, if there's some way to bring the Russians back to a different approach, I would go back to what the uh, U.S. side proposed back in 2013, which was the idea of an executive agreement on transparency that would require that each year each side would exchange data that said these are the numbers of key defense, missile defense elements we have, launchers, missiles, radars, and here looking at over the next 10 years is the project, projected number for each year. And the idea being that you'd give the Russians enough information where they could do the calculation and could say either this is not a threat or this becomes worrisome at this point with enough time that they could take steps in advance to protect their deterrent. And I think that would be a reasonable next step on the missile defense. Uh, and that would suffice in terms of dealing with the, tra uh, the missile defense question if you had a more reasonable Russian approach. The question of long-range conventional strike, which I think, again, is an area where the Russians have a lot of faith in American technology to the point where you have reasonably um, reasonable people like uh, Alexei Arbatov several years ago talking about could the United States mount an attack on Russian strategic forces using only conventional cruise missiles. Uh, I, I followed that conversation up with some people in the Air Force who said they don't really believe that American conventional cruise missiles have the, 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 have the uh, warhead size to actually damage, for example, Russian ICBM silos. You know, but there is that concern in Russia. And I would break down the concern about long-range conventional strike into three pieces. One would be conventional warheads on ICBMs or SLBMs, but that's taken care of by the New START Treaty, which does not distinguish between a nuclear warhead and a conventional warhead. 
The second area would be the question of hypersonic glide vehicles. Both the Americans and the Russians as well as the Chinese are looking at these. But when you talk to the people in the Pentagon, they say this will be a niche capability. Maybe we'll need 20 or 30 of these. Because a, 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 a hypersonic glide vehicle that goes 6,000 miles and deliver 1,000 pounds of conventional ordnance or 1,000 pounds of steel on a target, that's a pretty limited target set, and it's an awfully expensive way to take it out. And if you're only talking about 20 or 30 systems in an arms control environment, you could find a way to deal with that. The tougher question comes down to cruise missiles. Uh, and that's an area where, one, it's a huge part of American power projection. It has huge verification questions. Uh, and there's been a, for those reasons, it's been on the American side, a reluctance to talk about those in arms control terms. Now, things may be changing if the Russians are now developing their own conventional cruise missile capability. Does that change how the Americans look at this? And it, it's hard for me to think of what could be an arms control solution, but a first step on the question might be a conversation between the Pentagon and the Ministry of Defense in terms of looking at each other's cruise missile inventories what do you worry about? What do the sides worry about in terms of how that affects the strategic nuclear balance? Is there a real threat there? You know, is Alexei Arbatov's worry that American sea launch cruise missiles and air launch cruise missiles with conventional warheads could take out the Russian ICBM force? And begin to have that conversation. The th other uh, conventional forces in Europe, uh, that re regime broke down in 2008 when the Russians withdrew from the CFE treaty because NATO refused to ratify the adapted uh, CFE treaty, and that goes back to the Russians not uh, fulfilling certain political commitments they made with regards to withdrawal of forces from Georgia and Moldova. And at this point in time, I I'm not sure we have to worry about too much about the absence of numerical limits on conventional forces, because when you look at the categories, tanks, armored personnel carriers, artillery, helicopters, attack aircraft, that were limited both by CFE and the adapted CFE treaty, Everybody, with the exception of Azerbaijan and Armenia, are, are way below those limits. Uh, on the conventional side, I would argue that the things we ought to be looking at are really two. One is you know, specific regions. I mean, is there something that you could do, for example, about the Baltic region, where I think an area for NATO concern exists? And second, are the things that you could do, for example, building on the Vienna document on confidence and security building measures to increase things like lower the thresholds for notifications of exercises, uh, allow more inspections, allow more observations, because you're now in a period of time where both Russia and NATO are conducting more military exercises. Both sides would appear to have an interest in, in avoiding accident or miscalculation about those. So I would do that as, as a focus and then maybe later on return to the broader question of can you do numerical limits on conventional forces in Europe. And the last issue the Russians raise are third country nuclear forces, China, Britain, France, and others. And at some point, you have to bring them into the, into the negotiation. Arms control cannot forever just be an American-Russian enterprise. You know, but I would argue that the Americans and the Russians, given the differences in forces, again, the FAS numbers are about 4,500 total nuclear weapons for the US and Russia, the nearest third country being France at about 300. You could do one more bilateral American-Russian round before you had to think about third countries. And there's actually a logic to bringing all the weapons in because Right now, if the US and Russians are talking only about strategic forces, how do you ask the rest of the world to join? Because Britain is the only other third country whose nuclear forces solely consist of weapons that would be defined as strategic weapons under New START. Everybody else, their forces are largely or entirely non-strategic nuclear weapons. So that would be an argument, one more argument for the US and Russia to get into a negotiation covering their entire arsenals and then setting the stage to bring in third countries. The one thing that we might try to push third countries on, particularly Britain, France, and China, would be short of a full-up negotiation, could you get those countries to do a bit of transparency on, say, total numbers types of systems? And could you get those countries to adopt a unilateral political commitment that they would not increase their nuclear weapons numbers as long as the United States and Russia were continuing to reduce? Begin to get them a little bit pregnant on arms control. So I look at those areas and I say, in terms of nuclear reductions and the associated questions that the Russians have raised, there are solutions out there. Uh, if the Russians were prepared to be reasonable and re-engage on these issues. But the question I think we face, and this goes back to the first part of my talk on the U.S.-Russia relations, is when will the Russians be prepared to engage? And some, I think, in Washington would say the question is more, will the Russians at some point be prepared to engage? So at that point, why don't I stop? I'd be happy to take questions.